Hi, I'm gonna take you through a data log of our Real Street Supra. This is the fastest we've gone with the car. It's 677 at 209. And I'm just gonna show you some of the behind the scenes stuff with the computer that we look at and the, that we use with the computer in order to take such a small engine and go so fast with it. This engine is 3.2 liters displacement and it has a 94 millimeter turbo. It's an automatic transmission and it doesn't go well off the starting line without nitrous. So starting at the beginning of the run, Geo puts his foot to the floor, engine speed doesn't do much. Goes to 2000 RPM, once it creeps up to 2700 RPM, a nitrous kit turns on. That nitrous kit is gonna help make the engine more powerful to gain more engine speed. The more engine speed we build, the more exhaust gas volume we have, the more exhaust gas volume we have, the faster the turbocharger spins, the faster the turbocharger spins, the more boost we have, and then it really starts to perpetuate. But it's slow to get started. So as the engine speed builds, we've got these internal dump valves on the transmission, which are basically leaking fluid inside the transmission to help the transmission slip more. And we're gonna use those until we make a certain amount of engine speed and a certain amount of manifold pressure, and then we're gonna close those dump valves so that the converter is full of fluid and ready to charge the car forward as soon as it lets go of the trans brake. The trans brake is a device that you hold the car still by engaging first and reverse at the same time. So pushes the trans brake, pushes its foot to the floor, get a nitrous kit on and start to make some engine speed. If you look at our engine speed, we're nearly 6,000 RPM before it hits the revel meter, but we're only making just over 10 pounds of boost. But once it starts to ride that revel meter, and it has those pops that are leaving the exhaust port and, and going towards the turbine, that really starts to spool it up. So once it's on the two-step, it starts to make good manifold pressure. And as you can see, the engine speed starts to decrease. So we've turned the nitrous kit off. We're bringing the engine speed down. We're gonna bring the manifold pressure back down a little bit because we want around 26 or 27 pounds of boost to get the car off the starting line well. So as you can see, the engine speed is stabilized, the transmission charge pressure has stabilized, and the boost pressure is stabilized, and we're gonna let go of the trans brake now. So when we let go of the trans brake, we basically have this car that's gonna rush itself into motion. If we go um, just a little bit out in time, call it half a second, so for a half a second in, into the run, we're already at 7,500 RPM. So we were just at 5,400 RPM. Now we're at 7,500 RPM. We're now at almost 46 pounds of boost. We're gonna go out to around 7 tenths of a second. And you can see that we're riding this ignition lull. I have pulled ignition timing out because that's the easiest way for me to pull power. Big turbochargers are hard to speed up and hard to slow down. So I'll use the ignition timing because that'll move the horsepower of the engine around faster. So we're gonna pull ignition timing down because we wanna keep the nose down. We're now using a, a laser ride height sensor on the nose of the car. And between the laser ride height sensor, an adjustable front shock, the four leg suspension, the adjustable rear shocks, and the ECU, we're trying to get the wheelies to be a thing of the past. Wheelies are really cool to look at. However, they're extremely damaging to the car. So you can bend wheels, you can break suspension components, you can bend or kink the body of the car, you can smash oil pans. It's really cool to look at and super destructive. So we want the wheelies behind us. So we're, we're using a multi-tier approach because we don't have a wheelie bar. We're gonna ride through that timing lull. The nose is already up. If the nose goes too high, We'll pull even more ignition timing out, but for now, this is gonna work. So we've got the car underway. We can go out uh, around the 60 foot mark. We've got over 70 pounds of boost. The front end is stabilized. The rear suspension is still rising. This rear suspension position, you can see that it's still going up. And what that's doing is, as the rear of the car goes up, it's gonna keep the engine hopefully down. Once the engine is above the differential, 
it will really want to wheelie. So if you remember being a kid on your bicycle, once you got the nose of the bicycle up high enough, you could stop pedaling and do a manual. Or if you're on a motorcycle, if you get the nose too high, you cut the throttle and the nose doesn't come down right away. The same exact happens to a car once the engine is above the diff. So we wanna use that forelink to raise up to keep the nose of the car down, and that's gonna help keep that wheelie at bay. But we're starting to add that ignition back in, and we're actually gonna add more ignition timing than we started off with. So there's an ignition trim table that I can add timing versus race time, and I'll have more ignition timing in the car in the middle of the track than I will at the end of the track or the beginning of the track. The reason why I'm pulling the ignition timing out as we get to the end of the track is because everything's getting hot. From the time we let go of the trans brake, all this horsepower being made generates a tremendous amount of heat, and we're gonna try to mitigate that and be nice to the engine by running less timing at the finish line than we would in the middle of the track because everything's not really hot yet. This car still re requires to have a full cooling system, so it has a full-size radiator, it has water in the block, it has water in the head because we wanna be able to do another hot rod drag week with it. We want to be able to drive it on the street. Gio will take this car and, and drive it home. He'll go to a car show with it. It's, it's what he enjoys. His Part of the identity of this car is while you, you may not ever be able to make a pass on the street because it's so powerful, while you're driving it, you're driving a six second capable car. I mean, it's no small feat. So it has to have that cooling system. As we make our way to the top of first gear, uh, Gio is late on the gear change. If you look, first gear is pretty long. So he's gonna make that first gear change in the second gear. Second gear looks very short. Um, there's a lot of information that you can read about the difference between a two-speed and a three-speed transmission. Basically, when you have more gears, you can operate the engine in a, in a tighter window. Um, the very top tier of this would be NHRA Pro Stock, where the engine has a very small window from the starting line to the finish line and that's the window that the engine is happiest in. We don't want to have a situation where we go from 10,000 RPM to 6,000 RPM because at 6,000 RPM, the stress is gonna be way more because the, the cycle time, the time under stress is more. Like basically this thing's just Every revolution is, is tough for the engine under this power, and the lower speed is the slower revolutions. So it's equivalent to like um, you doing a bench press and you holding the weight just above your chest for 10 seconds before pushing it back up versus just bringing the weight down, pushing the weight back up. So you want that engine speed to be high enough to make it to the next engine cycle without fatigue. So we go from second gear now we're in third gear. The engine speed is horizontal for a period. If we had a two speed, it would be horizontal longer and it's harder on the engine. If you go back out a ways towards the end of the track, we're gonna have what looks to be another gear change. And what that is is the torque converter locking up. Get it, boy! We now have a pro torque lock up torque converter. So our old torque converter would slip around 4% at the finish line. This new one slips zero, and which basically gives us another gear to be able to go faster with less engine speed because the engine doesn't have a limitless RPM. We've turned it 11,000 a handful of times. There's not a lot of power up there. Um, it's not what I want to do. I'd like to keep things 10,000, 10,500 RPM. Next gear change or the converter lock up and we're on our way to the finish line. When we get out to the finish line, we have now picked up quite a bit of air inlet temp. So we started off at um, 67 degrees, and now we are at 169 degrees, and that's not exactly accurate because the air inlet temp sensor is slower than what the air is heating up. The turbocharger, the intercooler, all that stuff gets hot pretty fast. The air inlet temp sensor simply is playing catch up. So we need a faster air inlet temp sensor. Um, unlike a circuit car or a road car, again, this car doesn't get a chance to shed heat. It's just taking heat on as it goes down the track. So our coolant pressure is in check. It's under 20 pounds. Once that coolant pressure gets above, say, 30 pounds, 35 pounds, I know that it started to leak coolant pressure internally, and I know that I'm gonna have to take the head off and service it. 
I've had coolant pressures in the 50s before, and it's, it's a problem. It balloons the radiator. Um, it's a good way to crash the car. Now I shut the, the MoTeC will shut the engine off if it exceeds 45 pounds of coolant pressure. But that's our run. So if you want to look at it in real time to kind of gain perspective, we can play it. You can watch how fast everything happens. And I don't have a firsthand account of driving the car at this speed because I've only gone 697 in it. But I can tell you that there's a big difference between a seven second car and a six second car. When you, once you put the car in high gear and you're past the eighth mile and you take a look to see where the finish line is, for me, it was, it was hard for my brain to calculate that we are so far from the finish line, but the car was still accelerating so hard. Most cars that I've driven before in the past, once you put them in high gear, you're past the eighth, you're just kind of waiting for the finish line, whereas this car is really charging hard for the finish line. It's, it's pretty intense. So that's our run. And if you have any questions, as usual, I'll make myself available. Uh, feel free to contact us if you need some help with something like this. If you're using um, the MoTeC, I recommend getting uh, the i2 Pro. I, I've since upgraded to i2 Pro, and I can tell you that it's well worth the money. Um, it's much uh, quicker to go through your information. You know, if you have a thousand channels, it sure is nice to stack them up in one place and start running through things. So this is back when I had standard and I was just being cheap. I didn't know what I was missing. You don't know what you don't know. So anyhow, if we can help you, let us know. Thanks.